Well, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Um, tonight is part five of a five-part series, but the reality is I do not know if we're going to make it through all of part five tonight or not, so this will either be the final night of the series or it'll be the next to the last night of the series, depending on how far we get. In my opinion, the things at the end of this particular installment are the most exciting parts of the entire series. So I don't want to rush through it. Um, we'll see how far we get along tonight before the hour is through. I want to read one verse starting out, though. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In just a moment, you'll see why I have chosen this verse that talks about the light shining in darkness. Tonight, we are in part five of our series on a history of the Baptists and the Bible they preserved. And the title of tonight's segment is The Baptists Who Gave Birth to the Protestant Reformation. As you've already seen, Baptists are not Protestants. We never came out of we, we were never part of the Catholic Church, so we never had to come out of the Catholic Church. There have been Baptist churches in every generation all the way back to the days of the apostles. They've been called, we've been called, different names at different times in different places. And most of the time, the names that were given to those Baptists were names given out of derision by the enemies of the Baptist churches. They were the Catholics and those that were apostate churches before there was a Catholic church making fun, poking fun at, deriding the Baptist churches that tried to stick tenaciously to the Word of God in everything that they believed. So they may have been called by different names at different times throughout history in different places, but they're all the same as Pinnacle Baptist Church. Uh, by and large, they believe the same things we believe. And for the most part, in practice, they worship God just like we do. And so tonight we'll begin part five. The group tonight we'll be discussing are called the Waldenses. The Waldenses were an ancient group of Baptists whose persecutions by the Catholic Church at one time were known throughout the world. This group of Baptists were found throughout all of Europe, including the British Isles, before the Reformation ever started. Their motto, which is across the top of this uh, logo, this crest over here to the right in the picture, is Lux Lucet in Tenebris, which means light shines in darkness. And the elements on the crest are taken from the Bible. The seven stars represent the seven churches that are uh, portrayed in the book of Revelation. And then the candlestick, of course, is one of the symbols for a church in the book of Revelation, and it's intended to represent the Waldensian church remaining faithful to God all throughout the centuries. Throughout all of the dark ages of medieval history and beyond, both before and after the dark ages, these New Testament churches called Waldenses provided the only light that existed in much of the world at the time. Tonight is their story. So there are different versions of the story about where the Waldenses came from, how they originated, where they originated. Here's the Catholic side of the story. The Catholics say that the Waldenses started as just a, a new group that sprang up around 1170 in, the, in and around the city of Lyon, France. And they said that it was started by a fellow named Peter Waldo, and therefore the followers of Waldo were called Waldenses. Now, um, this supposed new group that started was around the area of southern France, like we've seen the Albigenses uh, in the last segment that we studied. And uh, so it's the same region, but the Catholics said this was a different group than the Albigenses, similar in some ways, but a different group. And they were just simply the followers of this fella. And uh, the Catholic bishop Mew claims, quote, when they first separated themselves from the Church of Rome, they had but very few opinions that were contrary to those of that church, or it may be none at all. So the Catholics are trying to portray the Waldenses when they began as really not being any different than the rest of other Catholics. 
They were just Catholics that wanted to do their own thing, basically. Now here's the other version of the story, uh, the version of the story that has history to support it. As we've seen with every other group of Baptists in every time period since the founding of the Catholic Church in the 4th century, there have always been uh, churches and the Catholics have always attempted to fix their claim on their enemies that they were just something new, some new group with new beliefs. The history of the Waldenses, though, tells us a different story. The Waldenses viewed themselves as the continuation of a biblical line of churches that had never associated themselves with Rome. And this is explained in a Waldensian document dated 1404. Now keep in mind, the Protestant Reformation doesn't start until 1517. So this is over a hundred years before the Protestants ever come into existence. And this Waldensian document says, We do not find anywhere in the writings of the Old Testament that the light of truth and holiness was at any time completely extinguished. There have always been men who walked faithfully in the paths of righteousness. Their number has been at times reduced to a few, but has never been altogether lost. And so they basically believed the same thing about themselves, that Elijah uh, and those that were believers in the Old Testament believed that there might have been a few of them at certain times in history, but they still continue to exist nonetheless. There's always been a continual line of believers in the true and living God in every period. Now, this theory does not suggest that there has always been a group of Christians that were called Waldenses. In other words, they don't claim that they've always been known as Waldenses. They just claim that their churches have existed all the way back to the apostles, but they might have been called by different names at different times. Uh, It also, though, doesn't equate their origin with Peter Waldo. They believe their churches have been around much longer than Peter Waldo in 1170. Any similarity to the name of Peter Waldo stems from the fact that they lived in the valleys of southern France and Switzerland and northern Italy and were therefore known as the Valences or Waldenses, which means people of the valleys. So... The Catholics trying to connect their name to Waldo is just trying to make them appear to be followers of some guy named Peter Waldo. In fact, their name is derived from the place where they lived, which was the valleys of the the Piedmont region. Here are some witnesses throughout history that attest to the real origin of their story, not the Catholic version. Jean-Paul Perrin around 1608, says this, The Valdoi, or the inhabitants of the valleys of Piedmont, received the doctrine of the gospel in the times of the apostles, either from the apostles themselves or by those who immediately succeeded them. This great apostle, speaking of Paul, having gained many disciples in this famous city of Rome, God made them instruments of planning the Christian religion in Italy and in Piedmont, which is a part of Italy. It's in the northern part. If it be true also that Paul performed his voyage into Spain as he designed, he took Rome in his way. And it is not to be doubted, but that if he went by land, he passed through Piedmont, for it is in the direct way from Rome to Spain. If he had passed through Piedmont, as in all appearance he did, it is certain he preached there, for he preached wherever he came. Since the valleys of Piedmont were enlightened with the bright rays of the gospel, the inhabitants of these countries have conserved the purity of the Christian religion without any mixture of human traditions. So they're saying that uh, there have been churches here in our region dating all the way back to the days of the apostles that have believed just what we believed without adding in all the human traditions like the Catholic Church has. Now, the Baptist historian Faber of the 1800s says that the Waldenses were, quote, a pure and never reformed church, still older than that of the Paulicians. We studied the Paulicians. They were during the Middle Ages. He says that the Waldenses actually traced their roots back before the Middle Ages even started. And speaking of their churches in the Piedmont region, the historian Samuel Moreland of the 1600s writes, It is most evident that they had not their original from the said Waldo, 
but that this was a mere nickname or reproachful term put upon them by their adversaries to make the world believe that their religion was but a novelty or a thing of yesterday. Thus, those who escaped the massacres in France were by the popish party surnamed either according to the places where they inhabited or the chief of their leaders. So he's saying the same thing, that they were not just the followers of some fellow that sprang up in 1170. But even a broken clock is right two times a day, and so it is you'll even occasionally find a Catholic that'll tell the truth about something. Renarius, who was one of the Catholic inquisitors whose job it was to go around and find all the Albigenses and Waldenses and bring them out to be persecuted, he said this uh, uh, writing against the Waldenses in the 1200s, which is the 13th century. He says that the heresy of those he calls Vaudoi, or poor people of lions, was of great antiquity. Amongst all sects, say he, that either are or have been, there is none more dangerous to the church than that of the Leonists, and that for three reasons. The first is because it is the sect that is, that is of the longest standing of any. Uh, for some say it hath been continued down ever since the time of Pope Sylvester, and others ever since that of the apostles. The second is because it is the most general of all sects, S-E-C-T-S, and for scarcely is there any country to be found where this sect hath not spread itself. So the Catholic Inquisitor is repeating things that he was told as he was questioning someone while torturing them. And the poor Waldensian that he was torturing uh, told him that the, uh, the Waldenses believed that their church had been around all the way back to the days of the Apostle, that it didn't start with Peter Waldo. And, uh, of course, they admit, even the Catholic here admits that the, um, the Waldenses had spread literally to every country in Europe by this time. And that's the 1200s, 300 years before the Protestant Reformation. The Waldensian connections to these other Baptist groups we've talked about. In the 4th century, that's the 300s, when the Catholic Church was started, Jerome, who was a Catholic, uh, he wrote and translated the Bible into the Latin Vulgate for the Roman Catholic Church. And he wrote against a preacher named Vigilantius from Lyon, uh, there in France, who espoused the same beliefs as the Waldenses. They were not yet being called Waldenses by the Catholics, but they believed the same thing as the Waldenses. But yet the Catholic Church says the Waldenses weren't around in the 4th century. It is likely that the Waldenses, though, were the descendants of a large body of Novatians that we talked about who fled the city of Milan in northern Italy up into the Piedmont and the Alps during the 5th century in an attempt to escape the Catholic persecution and the persecution by the Roman government as well. Some of the Bogomils or Paulicians from over here in Bulgaria and over there in Armenia who were persecuted in Bulgaria, eventually ended up in the valleys of the Piedmont, as well as Germany and southern France. Now on that map there, if you see the word Waldensians, that is the area of the Piedmont. It's kind of where uh, France and Italy and Switzerland, all three come together, and it's right in uh, the, the east, excuse me, the western part of the Alps Mountains. Then during and after the Albigensian Crusades in southern France, many of the Albigenses, or Cathari as they preferred to be called, fled up into the valleys of the Piedmont to join the Waldenses that were already there. They were trying to escape persecution by the Catholic armies. It should be apparent at this point that all of these groups, including the Montanists in Phrygia and the Donatists in North Africa, were all the same Christians. They were ancient Anabaptists who adhered strictly to the New Testament and believed the same things as modern-day Baptists. So all of those groups we've talked about are all related to each other. They're really all the same churches. They're just being called by different names in different places by the Catholics to make them appear to be a bunch of different groups. But they're really all just Baptists. 
but they had thoroughly infected, as the Catholics would say, all of Europe with the gospel 300 years before the Reformation. They're known to have sent forth missionaries throughout France, Spain, Austria, Bohemia, Picardy, Italy, Flanders, Bulgaria, Croatia, Dalmatia, Hungary, Prussia, and even as far north as into England itself. From the reports of their inquisitors, that is, the reports of the Catholics who were torturing them, we learned that by 1226, there were no fewer than 40 Waldensian congregations in southern Austria alone. And in the late 14th century, 11 Waldenses were sentenced to death in Vienna, Austria. Their pastor, likewise, in Hamburg. 400 Waldenses were tried near Brandenburg, Germany, Prussia, in 1392. And reports also indicate their numbers were hunted in the modern states of Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Switzerland, Bohemia, Bavaria, and Poland. Their home front in the valleys of the Piedmont were so numerous with their persons that in 1332 a meeting was held by their barbas, which is the word they used for their pastors. And in that meeting in the valley of Engronia, there were 500 Waldensian pastors that met for this meeting that were recorded in attendance from the churches in the valleys and mission fields around Europe that came to the meeting. By the way, they called their pastors Barbas, and the word literally means uncle. But they said that they chose that word because they didn't want to be confused with the Catholics who called their priests fathers. So they called their pastors uncle. So Uncle Milton, you're a Barba. All right, so... One of the things that the Waldensians believed is the separation of church and state. Now, not the concept of separation of church and state that's been pushed on us here in these United States, where that belief that Christians ought not be involved in the government. No, not that version of separation of church and state. Here's what they believe. They believe that the power of the state should never compel or force anyone to worship nor to support any particular church. They believed that the most egregious example of this was the formation of the Roman Catholic Church, which they believed to be the harlot of the book of Revelation. Sounds like you're a Baptist preacher, doesn't it? Regarding this matter, the monk Rancreus Sacco, who was a Catholic, says, says of the Waldensian position, quote, the Church of Christ continued in her bishops and prelates down to the blessed Sylvester. He's the one that Constantine got together with to start the Catholic Church. But under his reign, the church declined. They say, however, that at all times there have been God-fearing people who have been saved. So in other words, the Waldenses believe that the government should never force anyone to be a member or to participate in any church. The government ought to stay out of who people uh, worship and where they go to church. By the way, that's what Baptists today still believe. Capital punishment. The only other political or governmental issue addressed in most of the ancient accounts of the Waldensian beliefs was that of capital punishment. They did take a position on this issue. Repeating information from Albert Catani, another inquisitor, the historian Amelia Coma states that the Waldens has held that, quote, our rule also condemns the death penalty except for the crime of killing a man, which I think most of us would probably agree with that too. So if somebody kills somebody, like the Bible says, that person ought to be put to death. What did they believe about the doctrine of the church? Well, they believed, like we do, in the autonomy of the local church. The first a tenet of Waldensian theology in this category is the belief in the autonomy of the local church. That is the idea that one church should not preside over the affairs of any other local church. And this is made clear by Aeneas Silvius, who became Pope Pius II, when he wrote that the Waldenses believed, quote, that the Pope of Rome is equal with other bishops. And of course, the word bishop just means pastor. So the Catholics didn't like the fact that the Waldenses didn't think that the Pope, uh, who was the bishop of the church in Rome, 
was any more important than their pastor down the road in the, in the holler down there. Uh, they thought all churches were equal and autonomous and no church ought to rule over another church. The Catholics, of course, didn't like that. They also believed that there should be no differences between the pastors in the church and the congregation in the church, which is, of course, much different than what the Catholics believe. Their clergy basically live like rulers over their parishioners. Rainerus, again an inquisitor in Lombardy about 1250, said, quote, There's no difference among their priests. That priesthood is not a dignity, but that grace and virtue only give the preference. So this Catholic inquisitor said, I, I don't understand it. They don't, they don't make any difference between their, their clergy and their lay people. They view them all as equal in the church. He also said that the Waldenses believe, quote, that none in the church ought to, be of great, ought to be greater than any of their brethren. They reject all the titles of prelates or titles of dignity, such as pope, bishop, etc., and that no man ought to be compelled by force in matters of faith. They condemn all ecclesiastical offices. So they didn't believe in bishops, archbishops, popes, and whatnot. They just believed everybody ought to be equal, but somebody ought to be the pastor of every local church. And they ought to be equal with other churches. What did they believe about God? Well, the Waldensian Barba Morel, George Morel, offers the clearest explanation of their beliefs on the subject of theology proper. And I'll say more about him when we get towards the end of this presentation, either tonight or next week. He was actually martyred for the faith. The Catholics caught him, condemned him, and executed him. But here's what he said about God. We believe in a God in three persons. We hold that the humanity of Christ is created and inferior to the Father, who wished by means of it to redeem mankind. But we admit at the same time that Christ is both very God and very man. In other words, he's saying what the Apostle Paul said, that Christ was made a little lower than the angels for the purpose of our redemption. In this simple statement of faith, this Waldensian pastor expressed their belief in the Godhead or what many people call the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, and the hypostatic union of Christ, which is that theological term which means 100% God and 100% man at the same time. That's what they believed about God. Sounds like they believe a whole lot like Baptists so far, doesn't it? Liturgy. liturgy. In other words, the, the way that we worship in our churches. What did they believe about the ordinances of the church? Well, of those practices mistakenly identified as sacraments, uh, the same uh, Barbe Morel says this, We believe the sacraments to be the signs of a sacred thing or a visible figure of an invisible grace, and that it is good and useful for the faithful sometimes to partake of them if possible. But we believe that, if the opportunity to do so be lacking, a man may be saved nevertheless. As I understand it, we, that is Christianity in general, have erred in admitting more than two sacraments. So he said, listen, we believe in two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, or the two he's speaking of. We believe that you ought to observe those if you're able to, but if you can't, you can still be saved anyway but that if you do observe them, they are just a, a figure or a sign, a symbol of what they're supposed to represent. Same thing we believe about them. Not what the Catholics believe, that the, the, the wine and the bread literally become the flesh and the blood of Christ when you partake of communion. What did they think about the Catholic view of sacraments? Well, the Inquisitor Rainerus tells us that the Waldensians, quote, that the confirmation which is celebrated with anointing and extreme unction is none of the sacraments of the church, and that auricular confession is a piece of foppery. In other words, he said that they didn't believe that uh, anointing, confirmation, extreme unction, those different sacraments the Catholic Church created out of tradition had any relation to anything in the Bible. And uh, auricular confession is where the priest sits in a confessional booth 
and you, you're supposed to go in once a week or however often a week and confess all your sins to a man. He says the Waldensians believe that's just foppery. In other words, just, uh, just a show, just fake, just a fraud. Of the other Catholic traditions, uh, there was a Waldensian woman named Perinetta who was a subject of the Catholic inquisitors. They took this dear woman and questioning her because of her faith, she said that Waldenses detested the use of the Mass, canonical hours of vain repetition, councils and synods, the use of relics, and other traditions added by the decrees of the Catholic Church and her pontiffs, the popes. In other words, she said, we don't do any of those Catholic things, and we don't believe there's any value in them. Here's a, a poor dear Baptist lady who's been taken and she's being tortured for not going along with the Catholic Church. Here are some more of the Catholic traditions that they did not believe. According to the Catholics who were tor torturing them and questioning them, these ancient Baptists also believed these things. They believed that upon death a man's soul went immediately to heaven or to hell. No in-between. There's no place such as purgatory. They believe that it is of no use to pray to saints because God only possesses the authority to answer prayer. They believe that purgatory and indulgences were invented by the Roman church to make money off it. And they further held, quote, that it was an error of the church to forbid the clergy to marry. In other words, the Catholic Church might say that priests shouldn't be able to marry, but there's nowhere in the Bible that says a, a preacher shouldn't be able to marry just like anybody else. One of the interesting things that's kind of a humorous note, when the Protestant Reformation started, um, one of the Protestants there in Switzerland held a debate with one of the Catholic uh, monks there that was well known at the time, and when they met for this public debate in the middle of the town square there, all the people are standing around listening to the debate going on between the two. And the reformer, learning from the Waldenses, said, uh, we, you know, where in the Bible does it say that uh, the clergy, preachers, ought not to marry? And, of course, the Catholic came up with whatever his answer was because there's no place in the Bible that says that. And then the Reformer responded back, well, how then do you explain Peter, who you say is the first pope, having a mother-in-law? And the Catholic is said to have scratched his head and not wondered what he was talking about. And then the Reformer turned to the passage in the New Testament, which plainly says that Peter's mother-in-law lay sick a dying. And, uh, of course, the reformer said, it's kind of hard to have a mother-in-law if you're not married. So, what did they believe about practical living? Well, the Waldenses practiced two types of biblical separation in their lives, ecclesiastical and personal. Ecclesiastical separation means separating from those that don't believe right doctrine. And the Bible commands us to separate from those that don't believe what the Bible teaches. The other kind of separation is having personal separation, living holy lives, lives away from sin and temptation. Quote, we desire no communion with Catholics. We avoid also uniting ourselves with them in the holy bonds of matrimony. That sounds just like your Baptist preacher. We don't want anything to do with the Catholics. They're welcome to keep to themselves. Uh, they won't have to worry about us wanting to come over there and have anything to do with them either. And then they also believed, quote, that to swear upon any occasion whatsoever was a great sin. Besides, we should absolutely forbid, we absolutely forbid our people to swear. All dancing is prohibited. Neither do we tolerate vain and lascivious songs delicate clothing cut after the latest fashion. So, in other words, all of these things that the world has going on, we try to avoid those things, abstain from being worldly. Baptists today would do well to follow these admonitions as well. So what did they believe about salvation? Which is, of course, the most important of all doctrines. Well, speaking on this subject, that same Waldensian pastor, Morel, 
made the following statements. We hold also that there is no other mediator and intercessor with God than Jesus Christ. That is, Mary won't intercede for you. The saints can't intercede for you. The priest can't intercede for you. Only Jesus. Finally, we inculcate upon them, that is upon our members, as best we may, the doctrine of original sin. Hey, that's what your pastor preaches on too, that we're all sinners because of Adam's sin. And then last of all, that the doctrine of Christ and the apostles is sufficient to salvation without any church statutes and ordinances. In other words, whatever this book says about salvation is all you need to be saved without any Catholic church traditions or rules. Now, at this point, we have, we have gotten further along than I thought we were going to get. We're going to have time to finish the presentation. This was the halfway mark, and we're halfway through our service tonight, so I'm going to finish this out tonight. As with all the groups of Baptists, the Waldenses were known for their love of the Bible. According to the historian Ali, who wrote in the 1600s, they believed, quote, that, that what is uttered in the Latin tongue can be of no use to laymen. Most of their people in that day and time didn't know Latin. Do you know Latin? It wouldn't do us any good for us, uh, for the pastor to get up and preach to you in Latin or read the Bible in Latin or have you chant something in Latin that you don't even know what it means anyway. According to the Catholic inquisitors Rainerus and Sicilius, they held services in their own vulgar languages, that is, their own common languages, German, English, French, Spanish, whatever, and translated the scriptures into the common languages as well. They adhered only to the Old and New Testaments, none of that apocrypha stuff that the Catholics put in their Bible, and, quote, they contemn the canonization, translation, and the vigils of the saints. They did not accept the Catholic allegorized interpretation of Scripture. Quote, they refute the mystical sense of Scripture. They can say a great part of the Old and New Testament by heart. These were people that loved the Word of God. I mean, they memorized whole books of the Bible from the Old and New Testament. I don't know too many Baptist preachers today that can quote entire books of the Bible, uh, let alone... Uh, other Christians, but they could. The historian Perrin records, quote, but always held the Holy Scriptures to be the perpetual rule of faith and would never receive or believe anything but what they taught. That is what the Bible taught. And their doctrine was always the same as it is now. The Valdoists in the second article of their faith hold that the Holy Scripture is the rule of faith. And they teach that nothing is to be believed as an article of faith that they do not prove by clear proofs of Scripture. He said they only go by whatever the Bible says, and if you can't find it in the Bible, they don't believe it. Last of all, as to their learning, that they taught their children and their families the epistles and the gospels. Jacobus Ribera saith, that they were so well instructed in the Holy Scriptures that he had seen peasants who could recite the book of Job verbatim. There's your favorite book of the Bible, Brother Alex. And several others who could perfectly repeat all the New Testament. These are just common folks, but they could quote not only whole books of the Bible, he said they could quote even the entire New Testament. And if anybody's up for that tonight... Uh, I'll get with you after church, and if you can do it, I'll take you to Waffle House. <laughs> but their pastors also knew their Bible. The Baptist historian Wiley says of the Waldensian young men who were training to be pastors, the youth who here sat at the feet of the more venerable and learned of their barbas used as their textbook the Holy Scriptures. And not only did they study the sacred volume, they were required to commit it to memory and be able accurately to recite whole gospels and epistles. This was a necessary accomplishment on the part of public instructors in those ages when printing was unknown and copies of the Word of God were rare. 
boy, that'll weed out people that are just uh, wanting to sign up to be a preacher because they think it's an easy job. Tell them they have to memorize the New Testament. Yeah. Perrin also establishes this fact, quote, they are to learn by heart all the chapters of Matthew and John and all the epistles called canonical, a good part of the writings of Solomon, that would be the book of Proverbs, David, which would be Psalms, and the prophets. They had to learn pretty much the whole Bible by heart. In their defense before their accusers after the bloody massacre of many of their people in the valleys of Piedmont in 1488, the Waldenses said this to the Catholics, Do not condemn us without hearing us, for we are Christians and faithful subjects, and our barbas are prepared to prove in public or in private that our doctrines are conformable to the Word of God. They said, listen, just put our pastors up in front of you and you ask them whatever questions you want to ask and see if what we believe isn't exactly in line with that book. They also practiced distributing the Word of God in a time when the Catholic Church forbid, forbade anyone to have a copy of the Bible that wasn't Catholic clergy. And if you did have it, it better be in Latin, not the common languages of the people. Because the Catholic Church didn't want the common people reading what was in here and figuring it out for themselves. In his book, which chronicles the lives of the churches in the Piedmont, Samuel Moreland has printed the Waldensian Confession of Faith, which was presented to the King of Bohemia in 1508. And this is still more than a decade before the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther ever started. Here's what they said about the Scriptures. In the first place, all those of our profession do with unanimous consent teach and hold forth that the Holy Scriptures, which are contained and comprehended in the Bible, and which have been received by the fathers and established by canonical authority, are to be accounted as undeniably and without all controversy, most true and certain. Now, I'm not going to read all of that, but they simply are saying we believe the Word of God in that Bible, the Old and New Testament, with nothing added to it and nothing taken away from it. Uh, concerning the ministry of the gospel, they, that is their members, believe moreover that no man can attain true faith unless he hear the Word of God according to that of Paul. Again, that goes back to why that one group of Baptists were called Paulicians, because Paul is the apostle to whom the mystery of the church was committed. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. So they're saying that uh, in order for a person to be saved, they have to hear what the Word of God says about how to be saved, especially from the writings of the apostle Paul. Uh, the last line of that says... Uh, for that cause, for that cause, they in their churches do read the gospels themselves and other scriptures also in the vulgar tongue. The Frenchmen read the Bible in French. Spanish read the Bible in Spanish. So the Waldenses were breaking the law everywhere they went, translating the Bible into the common languages of the people. Of their feelings with regard to the Scriptures, the historian Thomas Armitage of the 1800s says it this way, A word may be needful on their preeminent love of the Bible. Stephen of Bourbon tells us of Waldo's care that it be translated into the peculiar Romance dialect. No characteristic was more marked in the Waldensians than their love for the sacred volume. And this love compelled them to share the treasure with others, by translations into the Flemish, German, and French. Neander says that their two characteristics above all others in Germany were their general distribution of the Scriptures and the common priesthood of believers. That is, we all can go directly to God in prayer. Herzog finds no sect which was so zealous for the circulation of the Scriptures as they, the Waldenses. Others built church systems and sought to make the Bible support them, thus rendering it a secondary means. But the Waldensians laid down the Bible as the foundation and built upon its truth. So whereas other religions would 
build up their religions and then try to find verses out of the Bible to support what they wanted to do. The Waldensians started with the Bible and made sure everything they did was built upon that foundation. Some of their translations of the Bible, and they literally translated the Bible into uh, dozens if not hundreds of languages all throughout Europe and Asia during this time period. In the 1100s, the Bible was translated into the Romance language for southern France. Uh, in 1179, uh, the Catholic, Walter Mapes, testified in Rome that he witnessed some Valdesians who had a book which contained much of the Old and New Testaments in the French language. In the 1200s, the Dugentista Bible was translated into the common language of the Tuscany region of Italy, where the ancient Etruscans were from. In 1200, the Roman church was responsible for an attack on the French city of Metz, in which the Waldenses themselves were forced to flee, and many of their Bibles were burned, all because news had reached Rome that the Baptist in Metz were translating the, the scriptures into the Gaelic language of the French people and passing them out to the French people in the countryside. The Baptist, Baptist historian Wiley says, From her lofty seat, Rome looked down with contempt upon the book and its humble bearers. By and by, she began to be uneasy and have a, a boding of calamity. He says the Catholic Church realized the Bible was getting out to too many people who could read it for themselves. Trouble was on the horizon. He also explains how the Waldensian pastors were responsible for the translation and distribution of the Scriptures into the common languages wherever they served as preachers. Quote, Part of their time was occupied in transcribing the Holy Scriptures or portions of them, which they were to distribute when they went forth as missionaries. By this and by other agencies, the seed of the divine word was scattered throughout Europe more widely than is commonly supposed. The New Testament, and as we learn from incidental notices, portions of the old, coming at this juncture in a language understood alike in the court as in the camp, in the city as in the rural hamlet, was welcome to many and its truths obtained a wider promulgation than perhaps had taken place since the publication of the Latin Vulgate by Jerome in the 4th century. He says the Waldenses were getting the Bible out there to all the different peoples throughout Europe in all the common languages. That's a problem for the Catholic Church because it sheds light on their many false teachings. They demanded, the Waldenses did, a literal interpretation of Scripture. They rejected the Catholic handling of Scripture, which had its origins with origin back in Alexandria that we saw earlier. Instead, they demanded the Scriptures be taken literally, not allegorized. The Inquisitor reported of their scriptural literalism as early as 1250 when he wrote this. They refute the mystical sense of Scripture especially in sayings and actions traditionally delivered and published by the church. In other words, even if the Catholic church has said the Bible means something, they don't believe it unless it literally says it. Uh, the Catholic Archbishop of Turin around 1500, still before the Reformation, says this, They acknowledged no authoritative rule of faith except the Bible receiving only what was expressly said by Christ or handed down by His apostles and rejecting the glosses of the popish doctors, they followed it in its plain and obvious sense according to the letter. That's the same thing that your pastor preaches here. Whatever the Bible says, we're to take it literally unless it tells us to do otherwise. They rejected the allegorization of Scripture and said just take it literally. But they continued to be persecuted. They were persecuted for centuries before the Protestant Reformation. When the Protestant Reformation happened, many of the Waldenses were hopeful that now they wouldn't be persecuted anymore because there were so many other people that believed in salvation by grace through faith or said they did, but it didn't happen that way. 
The persecutions considered, uh, continued by the Catholic Church and its supporters. The massacre at Marindal in 1545 saw more than 2,000 Waldenses killed, including more than 700 who were captured and then hanged publicly by the, uh, by the neck in the galleys, in the gallows. The massacre at Calabria resulted in thousands more Waldenses being killed and numerous of their preachers being round up, rounded up and publicly executed. I hope we don't ever see this in our day and time, but we shouldn't think that we're any better than any Baptists of any other generation that have ever lived. If God tarries His coming, these days of persecution are coming to Baptists again. The days are getting darker. We ought to be just as honorable as our Baptist forefathers and mothers before us. During the Catholic campaign in the Lucerne Valley to exterminate the Waldenses, their pastors actually led their parishioners in a military defense of their homeland and forced the Catholic army to sign an agreement in 1581. That is, the, the Baptist preachers picked up their weapons, told the rest of the men in their congregations, get your weapons, and all the, the Waldensian churches gathered all their men together there in the valleys and went out and fought against the, the Catholics for about a decade there. In 1655, the French stationed soldiers in the homes of the Waldenses. Same thing King George III did here in the colonies before the War of American Independence. But the king put French soldiers in the homes of every Waldensian family that lived in the Piedmont, and then, with a surprise, they massacred everybody that they lived with in what became known as the Piedmont Easter Massacre. The reports of this so outraged all the other countries of Europe that the famous author John Milton wrote a poem about the massacre of the, uh, of the, the Piedmont Easter Massacre. And you can find copies of it online. Finally, in 1689, with the support of the new English king, William of Orange, from the Netherlands, the Waldensian survivors who had fled to Switzerland returned back to the Piedmont to reclaim their homes with an army of 900 men under the leadership of Waldensian Henry Arnaud in what became known as the Glorious Return. So they came to reclaim their homes in the valleys with 900 men armed with weapons. God help us if it ever comes to that, but Baptists defended their homes and their families in the past. They should be prepared to do it in the future. The Catholics? They had the support of the government behind them. That's how the Catholics stayed around. The Waldensian influence on John Wycliffe. So here's where we come down the home stretch of our study on the Waldenses. The Protestant Reformation is coming up. The Waldenses influenced those who started the Protestant Reformation. Baptists are the reason there was a Protestant Reformation. In none of the history books will you ever read that Baptists were the reason that the Protestant Reformation started. I'm about to give you some evidences, some proofs that you're not going to read anywhere else. Most of what I'm going to give you is historically documented. Those that are conjecture, you'll see that it is conjecture and why it is believed to be that. But these are going to be evidences that you're not going to hear anywhere else. There were two men before the Protestant Reformation ever started that are considered the precursors to the Reformation. They lived a long time before the Reformation, but they protested what the Catholic Church was doing too from within the Catholic Church. That is, they were Catholic priests who protested what Rome believed, and they agreed with the Waldenses. The first one is a man you've undoubtedly heard of, John Wycliffe. He's known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, he is the first one known to have translated the entire Bible into the English language, about 1382. He eventually was, uh, was killed, martyred, 
And years later, the Catholics hated him so much, they dug his body up, burned his dead corpse, and threw the ashes out into the river. Before the time of Wycliffe, though, it is well documented that Paulicians, Albigenses, and Waldenses had all arrived in England. All of these groups established churches and translated the scriptures into the common languages of the people wherever they went. So either the ones that went to England didn't do what they did everywhere else they went, or they did do it, and the history books just don't tell us that they did. Wycliffe's followers became known as Lollards, which is a Dutch word that means to sing softly or to hum. If you read some of the secular books, uh, secular books will say it means to, to mumble or to mutter. It, it means to hum or to sing softly. It's a Dutch word. Now, history books, including the ones I read in college, will tell you that the English Lollards started with John Wycliffe and it was just the name that was given to his followers. But the reality is the name Lollards had been used for Waldenses almost a hundred years before John Wycliffe ever wrote, uh, translated the Bible into English. The name Lollard was originally used by the Dutch Waldenses across the English Channel in the Netherlands going back to at least 1309 where there's a written document that uses the name of Lollards for the Dutch Waldenses. And the fellow that wrote the report in Liege is written there. There are also historical accounts of a man that was supposedly named Walter Lollard who pastored the Dutch Waldenses in the early 1300s. The fact that Wycliffe's followers became known as Lollards is a testament to the fact that the Waldenses were already known to John Wycliffe and his followers before he converted and translated the Bible into English. It is possible that he did not know the doctrines taught by the Waldenses including, uh, it's impossible that he did not know the doctrines of the Waldenses, including that of salvation by grace through faith, and that he likely also had access to copies of the scriptures they had already translated into English before he came on the scene. Now, do we have documents that say that he already knew what the Waldenses believed? and that he had seen copies of their Waldensian Bibles in English. No, we don't have those things. But it would be almost impossible for him to be a Catholic priest in England with all the Catholic pronouncements against the Waldenses and him not know what they believed. It would also be very unlikely that he would not at some point have seen or heard of Waldensian Bibles or parts of Bibles already translated into English before he undertook to do it himself. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, uh, about 140, 150 years before the Protestant Reformation actually starts. Here's the other fellow that came along before the Reformation actually started. His name is John Huss. Now, Wycliffe lived in England... John Huss lived in Bohemia, which is today part of Germany. It's on the border between Germany and Poland. He was a former Catholic priest who was converted to Christ and began to preach against the Catholic Church in Bohemia until he was martyred for his faith in 1415. He preached against many of the heresies of the Catholic Church, including the sale of indulgences and the extravagances of the clergy, but his main emphasis was always on the importance of the common people having a Bible in their native language. wonder where he got that belief. Well, academia readily admits the influence of Wycliffe and his writings upon Huss. There is, no ab there is absolutely no recognition of the influence of the Waldenses. But again, history is silent despite the historical evidence to the contrary. First, as we've already demonstrated, John Wycliffe, who John Huss said was his biggest influence, Wycliffe himself was influenced by the Waldenses. So any influence of Wycliffe was an indirect influence of the Waldenses on Huss. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, even before the conversion of John Huss, the lands of Bohemia and neighboring Moravia 
abounded with Waldenses in the thousands. They had numerous churches and they numbered in the thousands. They had also already translated the New Testament into German and likely into the Czech language there in Bohemia as well. The proof that Huss and his followers, who came to be known as the Hussites, were already aware of the doctrinal beliefs of the Waldenses is the fact that after his death, his followers, the Hussites, merged together with the Waldenses to form a new group called the Bohemian Brethren nearly a hundred years before the birth of the Protestant Reformation. So did John Huss and his followers know of the Waldenses? Yes. Did they know what the Waldenses believed? Yes, because when he was martyred, killed, then his followers joined up with the Waldenses and formed the Bohemian Brethren. John Huss did not come to the belief in salvation by grace through faith and the realization that the people need the Bible in their own language. He did not just come upon that all out of the blue. He came upon those convictions because the Waldenses were so numerous in the land of Bohemia where he preached. So here's the Reformation connection. We're all the way up to the Reformation now, which is the end of our series. We have all been taught that the Protestant Reformation began by Martin Luther and later John Calvin, Zwingli, and others reading the Bible for himself and arriving at the realization that salvation is by grace through faith alone without any outside influences, just them and a Bible. In fact, Luther all but says as much in his autobiography. He basically says, I was sitting reading the Bible and read the just shall live by faith and bong, the light came on and he said, I realized that was the way people are supposed to be saved. Now, is that the reality of it? That's what he said. While this certainly is possible through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the written Word of God, if somebody reads the Bible, is it true though? Is that really the case? Or was he not directly influenced by Waldenses before he came to that realization? Let's see what the evidence shows. Well, here's the man who came out with a Greek New Testament in Europe the year before Martin Luther tacked his 95 theses up on the church door in Wittenberg. His name is Erasmus of Rotterdam, which is part of the Netherlands also. He's generally accepted as being one of the precursors of the Reformation. He was a Catholic priest, a philosopher, and an academician. He was uh, a scholar, in other words. He was critical of many things in the Catholic Church, but he chose not to leave the Catholic Church, even though some of the others who saw problems like Martin Luther and John Calvin did leave the church. He stayed in the Catholic Church. But what he did do, even as a Catholic priest, his contribution was monumental. He produced a Greek New Testament from existing Greek manuscripts of various ages and quality, acknowledging in his New Testament that the most reliable and accurate manuscripts actually differed in numerous places in the text from the official line of Catholic manuscripts. And the manuscripts he believed were the most reliable even though they differed with some of the Catholic manuscripts, were those of the Byzantine family of manuscripts, those that came from the old Eastern Roman Empire. Because these manuscripts were part of a larger family of manuscripts which agreed with each other more than 90% of the time, this line of manuscripts, of which there are thousands by the way, became known as the majority text. You may or may not know this, but 90 plus percent of all the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that have ever been found, whether they're a piece or the whole thing, agree with this book right here that I'm holding, the King James Bible, which came from the majority text, which was based on Erasmus' Greek New Testament, which he called the Textus Receptus, which is Latin for the received text because it's agreement with the overwhelming majority of all the manuscripts that existed. He chose manuscripts 
from the Byzantine line even when they disagreed with the Catholic manuscripts. And he was a Catholic priest. His Textus Receptus, originally published in 1516 and a couple of later editions, provided much of the manuscript source in Greek from which Martin Luther translated his German New Testament and from which William Tyndale and later the King James translator produced our English Bible. But Erasmus was influenced by the Waldenses too. But you won't read that in the history books. Being a Catholic priest and scholar, he was. it would be impossible for him not to be familiar with the Waldenses and what they believed. After all, the Catholic Church kept coming out with one decree after another condemning the Waldenses for what they believed. He could not have been a Catholic priest and not known who the Waldenses were and what they believed. The Waldenses were also numerous in the Netherlands where Rotterdam was located. In fact, it's there that the name Lollard, as we saw, was originally given to the Waldenses there a hundred years before Erasmus's time there in Rotterdam. And although Erasmus had access to virtually any ancient Greek manuscripts he wanted anywhere in Europe, he rejected all of those Catholic manuscripts and instead he got on his horse or in a carriage and he took a trip down to Switzerland into the mountains to the city of Basel, Switzerland. Why? Why go there instead of one of the Catholic universities that had all the hundreds of Catholic manuscripts? Well, he went there for a reason. But what was it about Basel that led him to believe the most reliable New Testament manuscripts would be there? Well, the Bible manuscripts that he used in Basel to produce his Greek New Testament came from two private collections who were printers and from the Dominican monastery located there. So two private collections and one Dominican monastery. So of all the places in Europe he could have gone to have gotten... Greek manuscripts, all the Catholic universities he could have gone to, he went to this little place in Switzerland where there were two private collections of manuscripts and one Dominican monastery that had some manuscripts. Why go there? He went there on purpose because he knew what manuscripts they had there. Let's find out what manuscripts they had there. Well, he knew Switzerland had been the center of Waldensian life in Europe for more than a thousand years. It was in the Alps Mountains where the, the Waldensians had fled a thousand years before that and had lived there for a thousand years and sent missionaries out all over Europe. Owing to hundreds of years of Catholic executions of anyone other than Catholic clergy possessing Bibles, any Greek New Testaments that were in private collections in Switzerland would almost certainly have been produced by Waldensian and Albigensian pastors who had been copying the Scriptures for hundreds of years. Because after all, the Catholics had said, anybody that's not a Catholic clergy that has a Bible, uh, the penalty is death. So if there are two private collections there, the most likely place that their copies of manuscripts of the Bible came from Albigenses and Waldenses, Baptists, who had been known for copying it uh, by the hundreds and by the thousands over that thousand-year period. So that's why he went there. And those manuscripts that were in private collections almost certainly came from Waldenses, The Catholic Church wasn't giving out copies to private citizens to keep. They were making it illegal for private citizens to have them. So the only people that were copying were the Waldenses, the Baptists. So those manuscripts in those two private collections almost had to have been Waldensian manuscripts. Or maybe Albigensians before they were massacred by the Catholics. Or maybe they were old enough that some of them were even Paulician manuscripts going back to the Middle Ages. The second source was that Dominican monastery near Basel. 
Now, I've got to remind you, the Dominican order was started in the 1200s specifically to run the Inquisition for the Catholic Church in hunting down Anabaptists, the Albigenses and the Waldenses. That was the whole reason the Dominican order of monks was started, was to hunt down Baptists in the Middle Ages. So, the Dominican order had only been created in the 1200s to hunt down Baptists. The Dominican order wasn't old enough to have their own ancient copies of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. So the ones that were there in the Dominican monastery undoubtedly were the ones that they had stolen, captured, confiscated from the Albigenses and the Waldenses. That's why they were stored in the Dominican monastery. So why did Erasmus go to Basel, Switzerland to get the manuscripts that he thought were the most reliable for his Textus Receptus? It's because he knew they were manuscripts preserved by the Waldenses, not the ones by his own Catholic church. And because he knew of the Waldenses' love for the Bible, he knew they would be truer copies, literal copies, not monkeyed around with like the Catholic copies. So here's the man that starts the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, the one who was a Catholic priest that tacked his 95 theses up on the church door at Wittenberg and... Um, said, these are my complaints against the Catholic Church, even though he was a Catholic priest. Well, you're never going to hear that he was influenced by Baptists before he got saved, but here are the facts that history documents for us. The entire New Testament had already been translated into the German language by the Waldenses by the 1200s, 300 years before Martin Luther translated his. Number two, on October the 31st, 1517, when he tacked his theses to the door of the church there in Wittenberg, would you like to know there was already a Waldensian church in the same city that is documented to have had over 500 members of that Baptist church at the same time he's the Catholic priest in town? Do you think for a minute that the local Catholic priest doesn't know there's a Baptist church in town with 500 members there, there's no way he could have not known it was there, no way he could have not known what they believed, and no way he could have not known that they already taught the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. Did he come up with that just by reading his Bible by himself one day sitting down? No, I'm sorry. He can say that's the way he came to that, but he might have believed it then, but he learned about it because the Waldenses in his own town uh, had a church of over 500 people there preaching that. And I guarantee you, being good Baptists, there were probably some of them handing out gospel tracts and witnessing. He might have even gotten witness to at some point. Who knows? When the Roman Catholic Church put a bounty on Luther's head, here's the next proof of evidence he knew what they believed already. When the Catholic Church put the bounty on his head, he went and hid out. Where did he go? Well, he went and hid out with those Waldenses over in Bohemia that were known as the Bohemian Brethren. So did he not know what they believed? Of course he knew what they believed. That's why he went to hide out with them because he knew they would take him in for believing the very same thing they believed. He knew what they believed already. When Luther translated his German New Testament, by the way, he used the Greek New Testament, uh, the Textus Receptus of Erasmus, to, uh, to translate into the German language, which means, since Erasmus's manuscripts undoubtedly were Waldensian manuscripts, his German Bible was using Waldensian manuscripts to produce it too. So Martin Luther, the one who is said to have started the Protestant Reformation, he came to his beliefs of salvation by grace through faith as a result of the testimony of Baptist. He did not come up with it all by himself. But are you going to read that in the history books? No. I, went, I took colleges, uh, classes in college on the Reformation. I never was taught any of this. They don't want you to know this. 
Here's another one of the reformers. This fellow, Ulrich Zwingli, was in Switzerland. There's no way that he could have not known what the Waldenses believed. He lived in Switzerland where most of the Waldenses themselves lived. Um, there's no way he could have not known what they believed uh, himself before believing in salvation by grace through faith. Proof of his knowledge of the beliefs of the Waldenses and other Anabaptist groups is his decision to persecute anyone who demanded adults to be rebaptized. Now, I'm sorry we have to say this about him, but he, like some of the other Protestant reformers, even though they left the Catholic Church, when they left the Catholic Church, they brought with them some of their hang-ups out of the Catholic Church too. Zwingli, even though he knew what the Waldenses believed, when he left the church and started his own church in Switzerland, he also persecuted Baptists. So the Catholics were persecuting the Baptists. Now the Protestants were persecuting the Baptists. And the Baptists did the same thing Pinnacle Baptist Church today does, that if somebody comes to us and they say, well, I was baptized as a baby, we're going to say, okay, that's fine, but that just means you got wet as a baby. So if you want to be a member of our church, you've got to be baptized by immersion after salvation like the Bible teaches. Believer's baptism. Well, he held on to his Catholic belief in infant baptism and he started executing Waldenses and Anabaptists uh, for, for baptizing adults. Here's John Calvin, the other big name of the Protestant Reformation. He too claims he came up with the belief of salvation by grace through faith all by himself with just him and a Bible. That's not true either. Here's the proof. He admitted to having been influenced heavily by the writings of both Wycliffe and John Huss, both of whom had themselves been influenced by Waldenses. So Calvin was indirectly influenced by the Waldenses even before he left the Catholic Church. Now, we also know he already knew that they taught salvation by grace through faith before he left the Catholic Church. How do we know that? Because guess what? When he left the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church put a mark on his head, and he had to go into hiding. He did the same thing Martin Luther did. He went and hid out with the Baptists for a while till things cooled down a little bit. When the Catholic Church placed a bounty on his head, he went and lived among the Waldenses of Strasbourg from 1538 to 1541. Now, it's impossible that he chose to go hide out with them without knowing in advance that the city had for hundreds of years been a stronghold of Albigenses and Waldenses, Baptists, for more than 300 years. In fact, in 1211, 300 years earlier, there had been 80 Waldenses burned at the stake in Strasbourg. And the Catholic Church had sent their armies to the city of Strasbourg numerous times to massacre Waldenses there over the centuries because the Catholic Church believed the entire city of Strasbourg was a Baptist city throughout much of the Middle Ages. While hiding out with the Waldenses in Strasbourg, he also edited and finalized his, his famous work, a systematic theology entitled The Institutes of the Christian Religion, in which he lays out all of his doctrinal beliefs in the Reformed theology. Much of what he wrote and rewrote as he edited were things he learned while he was hiding out with the Waldenses in Strasbourg. I like to jokingly but not so jokingly say everything that John Calvin got right is what he learned from the Waldenses, those Baptists. The things he got wrong are the things he refused to give up from his Catholic days, and he got those wrong still. In 1535, the Waldenses presented Calvin's reformers in Switzerland with a translation of the entire Bible into the French language as a gift. The Waldenses raised the money for translating the Bible and publishing it. 1,500 gold crowns to do the work. The, the Waldenses raised the money all by themselves and paid a man named Pierre Robert Olivetin. Well, who was Olivetin? Well, surprise, surprise, Robert Olivetin was a Waldensian. That's why they got him to do the translating. 
But look who else he was. He was also John Calvin's first cousin. So did John Calvin not know what the Waldenses believed before he came up with his notion of salvation by grace through faith? No, he didn't just come up with it off the top of his head while reading his Bible. His own cousin was a Waldensian, probably his aunt and uncle too. Who knows? Proof after proof after proof that these people did not just come to the belief in salvation by grace through faith simply by reading their Bible, although they could have, but they were all influenced by Baptists, every one of them, and it's historically impossible not to see it. Here's where we come to some of the sad part at the end of the story for the Waldenses. The compromise at Shonferon. After centuries of being persecuted by both the civil and religious authorities, the Waldenses were glad to see others, that is the Reformers, standing up to the Roman Catholic Church, and they were hopeful that it might lead to finally being able to live peaceably now that there were other people standing up for the truth too. In 1532, the Waldenses sent two of their pastors to speak to some of the different Protestants around Europe and bring them back details of what the Protestants believed so they could see if they believed what the Waldenses believed. One of those pastors, George Morell, as we already talked about, was captured by the Catholics and killed. But the Waldenses still gathered together, and they invited one of the Swiss Protestants named William Farrell and others, others of the Reformers, to meet with them at a place called Schonferon on September the 12th, 1532, in the Valley of Engrania. And there on, a, on an open hillside for six days, more than 150 Waldensian Barba listened to the reformers and then they voted. And they voted that they thought that their beliefs were similar enough to the Calvinist reformers that they could shake hands and join with them. Unfortunately, this compromise of their principles for the sake of having peace is one of the saddest in all of man's history. These descendants of ancient Baptists who had for 1,500 years maintained their doctrinal purity now compromised some of their beliefs, not all, but some of them, in order to secure what they thought would bring safety for their families. Unfortunately, not only did they compromise their doctrine, but they didn't get the safety and peace they were looking for either. For the next hundred years, they were mercilessly slaughtered by the Catholics while the Reformers stood by and watched. And some of the Reformers, in fact, like Zwingli and others, participated in martyring the Waldenses themselves for practicing believers' baptism and baptizing adults after the meeting at Shonferon. They were stabbed in the back, but they compromised their principles on top of it. So the Waldenses today, where are they? What do they believe today? Initially, most of the Waldenses cooperated with the Reformed Protestants, that is, the Calvinists. And Calvinists believe that God has already decided who will be saved and who will be lost. Man has no free will to choose Christ. They compromised their doctrine of 1,500 years to join with the Calvinists. But today, ironically enough, the Waldenses in many places around the world, including Italy and South America, primarily cooperate with the Methodists, who are not Calvinists but Armenian in theology. And Armenians believe the opposite end of the spectrum. They believe that even though salvation may be originally gained by faith, it may be lost as a result of a man's works afterward. Therefore, they don't believe solely in salvation by grace through faith at all. So they went from one extreme with the Protestant reformers to joining with Protestant reformers on the other extreme of the theological spectrum there. It's a sad testimony that after 1,500 years of maintaining the historic Baptist faith, the Waldens is compromised at Shonferon and are now spiritually schizophrenic. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you ever visit Valdez, North Carolina, it's a little town that was settled in 1893 by a bunch of Waldenses who immigrated to the States 
from there. Now that's our presentation on the Waldenses. A noble, honorable group of Baptists who really are the ones responsible for giving the gospel out for a thousand years and the ones that are directly responsible for the start of the Protestant Reformation, even though they're never given credit for it. But today, they're nothing compared to what they were in their stand for the Bible and for for Christ Himself. That brings us to the end of our study. That brings us to the Protestant Reformation. We won't continue beyond that in this particular study. Maybe at another time we'll talk about the modern Baptist movement. But I hope now you see that Baptists have existed since the days of the apostles all the way to the present. They might have been called by different names at different times at different places, usually made up names by their enemies, but they believed the same thing basically all throughout the centuries that we as Baptists believe today. They also preserved a pure copy of the Word of God down through the centuries that ended up being the basis for Erasmus's Textus Receptus, which became the part of the basis for the translation of the King James Bible with a few additions that the translators used from some other Baptist manuscripts, by the way. And you've also seen along this journey the line of apostate churches, which eventually in the 4th century became the Roman Catholic Church and continues to this day. But there have always been a line of true Bible-believing Christians in every period all the way back to the apostles. And there is today too. You ought to be proud of your Baptist heritage. Am I proud to be Baptist? Am I Baptist just because of Baptist in the past? No, But I'm a Baptist because Baptists believe what this book says, literally, without anything else added to it. And that's the same thing that all these groups of Baptists we've looked at have all believed as well. I hope you're proud of your Baptist heritage. And if you ever leave Pinnacle Baptist Church for any reason and move away, take a job somewhere else, I hope you won't consider going to any other church than a Bible-believing, fundamental Baptist church wherever you go. That brings us to the end. Are there any questions or comments as we finish tonight?